I am John Weltman. I am a father through surrogacy, as Marion told you. I am the president and founder of an organization called Circle Surrogacy, but I'm a 26-year practicing attorney, a commercial litigator in the United States. So I had no experience whatsoever in family law before this hit me, and it uh, came upon me simply because of my own personal experience, and I could go into a wonderful story about that but I don't have time. <laughs> so I will simply tell you that for the past 15 years, this has now become my specialty. Um, and although I still do commercial litigation, I am very much, um, uh, seem to be somewhat of an expert on this subject. Um, I think in order to understand this subject, you must understand the three types of surrogacy that exist. Traditional surrogacy is where a woman is artificially inseminated and she carries to term her own biological child and releases it to the couple by means of adoption. There is then gestational surrogacy. This only works for heterosexual couples who have both egg and sperm available to make a embryo in a petri dish that is then implanted to a woman who carries it. She gestates it. And the last is egg donor surrogacy, which takes that same concept of gestational surrogacy and adds a new person to mix, known as the egg donor. She then has her eggs retrieved. They are fertilized by the husband or in a gay couple, one of the men's sperm, or in some situations with gay couples, both of the men's sperms in two separate petri dishes, um, and then implanted into the gestational carrier who is still not genetically related to the child, which is very important in the legal system in America. Um, the history of these options is it's traditional surrogacy. We like to say that surrogacy dates back to the time of Hagar and Abraham in the Bible, but as a commercial enterprise in America, it has been going on for about 30 years. Um, and uh, it started exclusively with traditional surrogacy. It was only a little over 20 years ago that they developed the concept of gestational surrogacy, and so that is something that is much more recent. But in the past 10 years, it has been almost exclusively gestational or egg donor surrogacy. Because of the legal situation, um, traditional surrogacy has almost become a thing of the past, not completely. Um, why do people travel to do this? Because there are no other countries in the world that come close to America. And I'll get into that in a moment. Um, the United States is the only country with a 20-year history of exclusively finding in favor of the intended parents. So long as in the state where the surrogacy is done, surrogacy is legal, and that's true in 44 of the 50 states, the contract will be upheld in accordance with what Johnson versus Calvert in California established in 1990 as the intent rule. Simply con standard contract law. Um, and it's very important to differentiate this from the cases that had preceded it in the traditional surrogacy field. In traditional surrogacy, because a woman had been carrying her own genetic child to term, there's a set of laws called the Uniform Parentage Act in America, which provide that a woman may have anywhere from one to ten days to change her mind. I'm going to go through the options outside the United States and my problems with them. In India, the biggest legal hassle that we've faced has been the fact that legally the gestational carrier and her husband are the parents of the children. And so you must do an adoption in order to get the intended parents on the birth certificate. As far as the Ukraine is concerned, one of the concerns is that these children do not get automatic citizenship. In the United States, any child born in the U.S. is automatically a U.S. citizen. But in the Ukraine, that's not true. So you have to go in and flag that you've done surrogacy in the Ukraine and then try to get the Irish consulate to give you some sort of visa papers because you can't get the child back here and it causes enormous problems. And the third one, which is the United Kingdom, is my least favorite of all. Although it permits surrogacy, it pay, you can only pay about 5,000 pounds, so you have multi-year waiting lists for these women. But most importantly, um, you have a woman who has the right for six weeks to change her mind. And there have been a number of cases in which gestational carriers have changed their mind and kept children that are not genetically related to them, that are genetically related to other people, and there's nothing those people can do about it. There is a very, very interesting set of laws in America that go beyond just what's enforceable in the contract that have huge impact on people traveling for surrogacy. So, um, 
The first is a choice of law issue, which is the issue of what law governs. So for example, I have many, many New York clients who can't use a surrogate from New York and are very concerned, what if New York law applied to me? But the courts of Massachusetts have been really wonderful about this and have helped clarify that actually the law where you live has no impact whatsoever. It's the law of the state where the surrogate lives that governs. The biggest issue in the United States is not the law. It is the insurance nightmare of our country. Obama was not successful. Not, do not let the press make you believe that we have any kind of a national health care system. The step we moved forward was nothing like any of the steps Kennedy or Johnson accomplished in their Senate career or their presidency. It is a very minor step forward. Um, and it does not establish national health. What does that mean? You must get a, you must realize that when a surrogate delivers her children, uh, and if she has any kind of an exclusion for surrogacy in the maternity or general exclusion section of her policy, she will not be covered for those charges. Now, a woman who's delivered two, three times before delivering one child is going to have $10,000 of charges. It's not a big deal. But a woman who delivers one child should expect about $4,000 of medical bills, which we can maybe cut to two, but a woman who delivers two can expect $98 thousand dollars of medical bills because one child is generally born at 39 weeks and two children are generally born at 35 weeks. That's average. You start going before that, you're spending a couple weeks in a natal intensive care unit and you can expect a six-figure amount of money. So as a result, we have to try to get the surrogate's insurance to cover not just her maternity and delivery, but the children as well. The way these policies read, they talk about it being her natural child. There's been no interpretation of those. We just have American Bar Association meetings with insurance companies to go by. But most people interpret the word natural to mean biologic, not genetic. Does she deliver the child? If you get into court and before the birth, you establish the rights of the parents to be the parents, now the insurance companies are going to object. They're going to say it's not her child, they're not responsible for those children. So you must wait until after the birth to do a post-birth order. We avoid the adoption. It would be the nicest thing. Many countries I can do an adoption in, and I prefer it because it's nice and simple. I put her on the original birth certificate, now they can't complain at all, and then I do the step-parent adoption. But I can't do that here because of the adoption laws. So these are the critical things that we always watch out for when we're working with people. How do we deal with gay couples? So I'm about to begin dealing with this for Ireland, but I've been doing it in 43 countries, uh, and I think that Ireland is actually easier than most countries. Um, so we can't put two men on a birth certificate. They won't be let back in here. We're going to do originally the situation where we have the man on the birth certificate with the gestational carrier, he will do one of two things. He will either just get the American passport and return home and then file his paperwork with the gestational carrier signing everything she needs to to get the Irish passport. Nobody's going to ask any questions. Or he can go to the Irish consulate. So far we've had pretty good luck with it. I would say with my first Irish gay couple, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say, come home. I found it infinitely safer in every other country. The only times I've ever run into problems is when they try to go to a consulate in the United States because everyone in the consulate in the United States thinks surrogacy. Why are you traveling? How come you had a baby here? What's going on? And they think surrogacy. You come back here, nobody thinks surrogacy. Generally speaking, bottom line here is if we're dealing with a gay couple, we return the buyer dad on the birth certificate with the gestational carrier with the court order terminating her legal rights or at least depriving her and giving him all custodial rights. We will potentially do a second parent adoption in the United States but not amend the birth certificate. They need that woman on the birth certificate. And then no matter what, we always will turn to Irish counsel because I want to be apprised both before I make the match if there's been any change in the laws here, before I do the finalization of the parental rights if there's been any change in the laws here. And if anybody has some brilliant ideas, I want to be informed of those as well. So we work very closely with lawyers from other countries to make that happen. Thanks.